Okay, so if all the um, speakers could come up and sit here, that would be great. Um, we've got uh, about half an hour for discussion, um, and there's quite a lot to talk about. There's tons of questions that I have. Um, I might kick off and then throw it out. Um, and um, I'm going to be really hard. If you don't wait for the mic, I'll cut you off. We're recording this. Ooh. And um, uh, we've got some roving mics, so please wait, because it's um, really important that we capture your questions and that the um, speakers can hear you. Um, I, w I wanted to start with, because you've all touched on it, and it's obviously the, the, the critical um, kind of question, really, is how, how do you begin to explore and develop your sensitivity to place and to context and to the different... Um, cultures um, that you're working within, uh, because it obviously presents quite a significant kind of design-led opportunity, but also um, you can open up a whole sort of host of, of issues. And uh, you know, Roger, the last slide you showed of the the, the, the copy of your your competition scheme with, in China, there's a very different understanding of the, the the notion of the copy. And so, how do you get to those kind of different uh, meanings and understandings? And um, uh, I think maybe it would be it would be good to hear the the ways in which each of you have um, have tried to address that, whether that's sort of research that you do before you go establishing yourself in a place and, and getting really deeply rooted in historic architectural sort of uh, references, or whether it's about collaborating with partners in country and so on. We could maybe unpick some of that. Oh yeah, you have to share the mic as well. Sorry, or you can come up here. Join so in should be on okay. in Doha, the we did a huge amount of research with the client team. So in the very early stages, um, they developed a, a series of um, guides on architectural language, and it was part of the master plan responsibility. Uh, and that we had teams um, doing a lot of sketching. Um, our partner at the time, Tim McCower, did an enormous amount of time walking the city and there are huge volumes of digital photographs which were reference points. So a lot of research. Um, that client was very interested in us understanding their culture. Quite often um, projects come where they're actually wanting an international building. So they're surprised at how much you're interested in bringing um, uh, advancement in architecture in terms of spatial quality. So in our project in Beirut, um, they were very impressed with the planning of the flats and the concepts of the site planning, but um, they were surprised that we were so interested in their architectural heritage. Mm. So it can be the other way around too. Um, I mean, quite often it's... It <laughs> It's down to, they want an international architect. And I think, what the hell are you, what does that all mean? You know, because it, it, it just seems so totally uh, in, un, unfortunate that that sometimes is what's, what's uttered. And no matter where, even in Australia, so, oh, we like your international brand and what you, well, hold on a minute, what, why are we here? So what's the difference? So I think that, even on Australia, I think that there is a uniqueness of place that you have to eke out of it. And that mainly, what I would say in that context, is a changing cultural balance from anglicised to more uh, Southeast Asian. Um, an understanding of climate, and where, certainly in Sydney, the way the climate, you know, the winter's kind of a month, and then it doesn't go below 10 degrees. So, uh, you know, single glazing everywhere. It's, it's a completely different culture physical, metaphorical culture that you have to work with. Um, and then having worked for HSBC Bank in Geneva, um, understanding the sort of neo-Germanic sort of notions of coolness uh, to do with stripped back minimalist type aesthetics, which, you know, close to my heart, I'd say. But actually that's, that's what they wanted. As soon as you put a frill on something, it became quite, quite a challenge. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> for us, we're at the beginning of a journey, really. I mean, I've talked about 10 years, but I still think we're, we're just starting to play with this. We're asking ourselves, what, what services are we offering? Um, 
and I do think there is something about in, about the strength of architectural design in London, where it is a collaboration itself with the engineering disciplines that we work with. Um, so I think I'm right in saying, if, if you look at the UK, we, we have one architect for about two and a half thousand head of population. I, I think if you compare that with China, there's one architect for 200,000 head of population. They're, they're just chronically short of design skills and architecture. So almost you can you can go to China and get off the plane and say I'm an architect and someone will give you work I mean it's it's it's, it's almost like that you, you and and we we did a bit of that we just took on projects and and we found that we were not getting paid for it or that what was being built was nothing like what we'd really intended it to be so we've taken a few steps back I think sought to collaborate with practices who've been there longer than we have um, it is still easy to get work in China, I believe. It's perhaps very difficult to get paid work. Um, it's, um, but I think it's finding clients who respect what we bring, and, and, and these are perhaps more complicated projects um, where you do need to bring in um, the sort of ACOMs or Arabs of this world to sort of bring in that, that coordination. And, um, you know, I, I think the technology of... Um, of BIM is allowing us to do this more and more. You know, I, I, I say it to a lot of clients, I, th I think it's true in a lot of architectural practices, we don't do drawings anymore. You know, we, we just create virtual reality using components. And if you can actually get those components together in a BIM model, then that BIM model can be exported anywhere. Um, so that so who is going to coordinate that? All the, all the input from the engineers um, and different architects working together, someone needs to coordinate it. And that's where we see our role emerging at the moment. Um, I, think, I think our experience is a little bit different uh, being 25, 30 years in China. Um, yeah, it's true, they build what they want, but I think it's, it's, there is a case of going there and going on site and checking what actually is happening. And most of the times, they actually listen to what you do. So I haven't shown any projects. Interestingly, the South Beijing station, which I showed earlier, I went there about five, six years ago with one of our technical directors, and he was showing me around. And you know, he said, "Well, they build it differently from what we des designed, and everything like that." And he said, "Actually, don't walk on that glass." And I'm like, "Why?" He says, "Well, they didn't do the glass, so I'm not happy. If you walk there, you may actually fall through it." And I said, "Okay, but." The, they, they build the building the way we design it. So I, I think it, it takes, it takes I, I do believe it takes time. It takes, you know, you said 10 years, you know. I think we've been 25, 30 years there. It, it does, and it takes a presence, and it takes a, a kind of understanding the culture. Uh, a lot of the projects which we have currently in the UK are with uh, clients from that side, and they do operate on, maybe not on the crack cocaine, on uh, FSA, but there is a different way of making the building more efficient, and it is the same way we, we've seen for the last 20, 30 years. So I think it's just learning to work with people is actually what's key, and, and the more we do that, the more we actually manage to do that. But it is a different process, and just one last example. Again, it was my last trip to China, looking at projects was a couple of years ago, and then there was a whole basement full of, of bits of curtain walling being cut off. So what they do is they get these long strips of curtain walling and just cut them on site and everything which they don't need they just throw in the bin. And it's like it's a different way BIM doesn't you know change that. That's the process of, of, of how they work there. So learning how they how things are done in one culture uh, would inform how we design as well. So I think it's just it's just working together. That's that's really what I can say. Um I wanted to ask um your your all practices that are fairly well established of a certain scale. Um, one of you, I can't remember who said, you know, don't even think about it unless you're of a certain size or, um, uh, and have the kind of infrastructure. And I, I just wonder what advice you might give to practitioners who are maybe earlier on in their career path or have a less well established or the practice is younger in terms of its, its uh, years of existence rather than age, but what the opportunities are, whether doing something on, on one's own or partnering with a, with a bigger practice like, like your own ones. So I think our first project abroad was in Dublin, started in, if I remember right, about 1989, Marianne, something like that, finished in 94, and we were a relatively small practice. I think during um, the working drawings, we experienced our first recession. Um, we went from about 25 people down to about 18. 
um, having work abroad was our first lesson in diversification and um, the fact that it was happening abroad, it was less affected by the recession. So you don't need to be a very big um, office. You need to do competitions. Um, our IBA international co competitions um, are well researched. So um, the front office used to do these very good competitions, does it less so now. Um, but look for the competition opportunities and it doesn't matter if you're a small practice. If you have a really good idea and it's a well set up competition, it's a great opportunity. Um, I was in a sauna in Stockholm with our, um, with our client um, and we had a lot to drink and, and I said to him, well, why did you give us the job in the first place then um, after a, bit, a few drinks? And he said, well, it's because you and Russell came in and you made us laugh. Um, so I, I think you've actually got to go and you know, have a laugh, really. You know, you've actually got to bring fun and enjoyment in, in, into the process. You know, it, it is more than just being dull and you know, um, you have to have a relationship. The, the guy, the guy in um, South Korea, um, who we did the Paradise Hotel with. I mean, I, I think that it will be a great project when it's finished. And we did do a lot of detail there. He was um, one of South Korea's leading drummers. So I've been done, done karaoke with him um, at about 4 a.m. doing Sultans of Swing. There's a, there is a CD somewhere of this. You have to have that relationship with your clients, and you have to be prepared to just get out and travel and, and um, you know, promote yourself and promote your business. I can't top that, can I? <laughs> <laughs> well then, um, no. Uh, so I'll say size doesn't matter. It really doesn't. And I think it, much more important is um, the, the relevance that you have to the particular market that you're in. So either you've got family links or you've got a mate that lives there or you know, whatever it is, um, linguistic, cultural, Anything, I think, is, is you, need, you need a key to unlock that door. Um, and it's not size, that's for sure. And just to add, our first project in China was uh, a competition. So yes, competitions and collaborations, as uh, people have highlighted. I think that's key if, if the practice is smaller. I would say that. OK. Um, does anybody out there have a question? No, I can keep going. Don't be shy. Come on. Yes. Right. Is that okay? Wait for the microphone. Thank Sorry. you. Sorry. Hello, my name is Aniko. Is that okay uh, to know people? I mean, if you go for a competition, uh, from your experience, is that important that you know someone from the jury? Or because of course I know, not. I know about my country. <laughs> I know my my country you have a chance to win if you know someone from there. So internationally, how, how can you manage this? We've had many competitions in France and other places which we haven't won, and I'm sure yeah. the other panelists here. You never know. Of course, if the more you know, the more you know people, it helps. Of course. Um, so is uh, we have tried quite often to win work in France, and we have failed. Um, we... Uh, have quite often got down to the last two and thought it might be an opportunity. Um, we're currently collaborating with a French firm um, on, a comp on a master plan competition in France. So collaboration is a real key and some countries are less interested in outside uh, architects from other countries. And it's just a cultural difference. Um, but when the chips are down, when there's a recession on, um, you're much more likely to be brave and give it a go because there's nothing to lose if you've got a good idea about the site um, to, to try, really. Yeah, so it is related somehow if, if you collaborate with a local architect or the key ingredients. I mean, we still get our architect in India, who we really enjoy collaborating with. Um, they're quite often the first people to find out about a competition in India, and they will ring us and say, would you be interested in doing this with us? So once you've built great relationships, they, they do last and they, and they come back. Okay, thank Anybody you. Anybody else? Other questions? Yeah, thank you. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for the very nice talk. Thank you. Uh, my question is mainly about the Middle East. I mean, I worked there for many, many years. And 
Do you find that if you associate yourself with a big local office, well-established local office, it would help? Because they have the contacts, they know the clients, they know the ministries, rules and regulations, and um, even in Qatar, they know, say, Qatar Foundation, etc. They know the people Can there, hold, and hold the Qatar Petroleum, and Qatar Petroleum as well. So it, that would help. Do you consider that, or do you work on your own there? Um, probably every project has been different. Yes. So on the Mashera project, um, Burns and McDonald, who happened to be an American firm, were already installed as the um, technical executive architect. Uh -huh. They had another relationship with a local um, Qatari firm. So that was a given to us. Yes. Um, okay. uh, we have chosen local architects in, uh, in other regions. So we have uh, um, a great relationship with um, an architect firm, with uh, uh, Rashid Karim. He is working on our solid air project. Oh. Um, we have gone in for other competitions in the Middle East with him saying that he will be our executive architect. It's about building relationships yes. um, with these people. And quite often, if the client um, enjoys the exec uh, local architect and wants to work with them, um, you'll find that they're a knowledgeable person and um, there's value in that. So we, if j I never, you know, we never really had the thing where somebody, you feel somebody's been foisted upon you. Mm. Usually, the client has good reason for recommending that practice because they're good architects and yes, yes. Um, then they're good to collaborate with. Okay. Any other else? Sorry. No. One last question. Uh, when you do projects in the Middle East, basically, do you do just the concept or do you do the whole thing, the whole package? Um, because that's where the local office it, comes in, a lot of them. Okay, so it varies. So we did um, a full detailed design stage for Musharab and then we had um, some involvement through the um, working drawings um, phase. Um, our, our, we did on the facades. We did more mm -hmm. than um, standard DD stage mm -hmm. in order to for them to be able to process it and actually procure it um, in advance of the rest of the building design to being advanced. Um, we did a small barge which became an um, uh, an exhibition centre for the Mashera project and is now an education centre. Um, we not only did the drawings, um, uh, three guys went out there and virtually lived it um, uh, and partly painted it on the last day as far as I can make out. Um, so it, it has varied hugely um, and the main thing is understanding and being very clear about what you're going to do. When we, we don't tend to be concept architect and let it go. We like to do the detailed design and then hand it on in good shape that somebody knows what the design principles are. Fully that's what we would you. that's what yeah. that's what we would aim to do if we can. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. And any other questions? We've got one at the front here. I'd be interested to hear any insights you've got as to uh, how these clients abroad might view architects in London and um, how, how we're unique and special to them as opposed to just them going to one of their local architects in a way that we might not appreciate as, as London architects. We might not appreciate how we're valued abroad. Oh, we're the best on the planet, for God's sake. You know, it's, it's, an, it's a no-brainer. Um, I, I think... <laughs> I think there is uh, there's a number of things. One, we've got a fantastic education system, which, you know, having traveled along uh, all over the world, there are a few that can match it. So we, we do bring some great architects to market. Um, secondly, I think we have, uh, I say we, it's very difficult, it's, it's very generic, but in culturally, I think we're, we're quite calm. <laughs> we're quite, we're kind of, you know, can take a lot of stuff from around the world, and, and we're kind of used to it because we're well-traveled. Um, I, I must say the English language clearly makes a massive difference to uh, almost everything because uh, of what uh, that, that offers in terms of communication skills. Um, but our ability to negotiate, uh, our sense of democracy and fair play, I think is also very, very important. Um, I know that sounds a bit old-fashioned and traditional, but actually that does underlie a lot of the way we do business, and I'm sure... Um, others around this table would be the same on that. That you know, you, you feel as if you're going into um, 
uh, a project with a, a, a sensitivity and a responsibility and a sense of fair play. So I think that's something that we offer. I agree with all of that. I think the other factor is that uh, certainly post-Brexit, the pound's taken a bit of a pummeling, um, and so we are seen to offer good value to overseas clients. I would say that in London, you see um, buildings built of really good quality. Um, I think I went to New York recently, and I actually thought it was quite disappointing how some of the new buildings are built. So you can take, client, you can take foreign clients around your projects in the UK, and they will generally be pretty impressed by the standard of the build and the quality of the way, and even if you're working on a design and build contract, the quality of the delivered project, uh, projects in this country is quite high, and a lot of people come to the UK and see that and admire that. If I can just add yeah, all of these things, but I think there's the independence of the architectural profession in the whole industry, which is quite important. A lot of other countries you have links are much more closer between different parts of it. So I think the architect being an independent entity which generates design and also checks other people's uh, good work is, is actually quite an important thing, which I think hardly exists in any other parts of the world. So it's actually it's quite an important independence kind of taking the design forward idea, which not many other places do. I've got a question just back there on your right. Hello, my name is Dana and I wanted to thank you all for your presentations. Um, as some, I've actually grown up in Qatar for 18 years of my life and I just wanted to know when you're working in other regions, do you solely bring your own architects or do you also hire local ones to help you with your projects? Um, so we almost consistently, when we had an office in Qatar, had um, a Qatari student working with us. Um, if I could change one thing in Britain at the moment, I would change the ability to hire more international architects. Um, I mean, we have a quota of visas at the moment. I've got managed, my fantastic HR manager has managed to win two more tier two visas recently. Um, but it's, um, uh, our, our office is 38% non-British passport holders at the moment. Um, it's a melting pot of ideas and nationalities and long may British architecture be exactly that. Um, the international atmosphere within our offices is one of the best um, creative um, uh, aspects of architecture and um, if we could employ more architects from Qatar who are well trained we would be delighted to do so. Um, we, they brought a lot of cultural knowledge to the project and understanding about how to do things and how not to get cross in meetings with your client and various other things um, and have a lot of respect for um, the process. Um, so the more we could employ um, international architects locally when we're working on a project and in the UK, I would be the first to sing hurrah, really. And could I bring that back to the previous question and just ask whether one of the USPs for clients abroad is the international makeup of many offices here in the UK? Do they seek that sort of diversity of, of I, I don't know whether they seek it. I'm going to pass this to somebody else, but I know that when they are in the offices, they are delighted to hear that you already have, you can produce, you know, overnight somebody says, can I just come and see your office? And you can produce usually somebody who speaks the language and has some education in, in the country. That probably does help. Um, we're just um, talking to a Greek client who um, was delighted to hear that we, are, uh, we employ an architect from Athens but he did stress right at the beginning, he says, she's not from Cyprus, is she? <laughs> I think the profile of our office is very similar to Joe's. We have about the same sort of percentage of, of uh, non-British passport holders. And it is very uh, useful, I think, to have people who've got language skills from around the world who can, who can uh, interface with the clients, the client representatives. So that, that's working well for us. I was going to come back to the question. Um, we've been through this process of setting up 
at the office in the States. Um, and we're incorporated in Delaware, which apparently is the thing you have to do, um, even though we're operating out of LA. Uh, um, and, and we have to have our business plan agreed by the um, American authorities. It specifically states that we have to employ 50% Americans. Um, that, that, that it's one of, the, one of their rules. Um, so it's very tricky when you've got five people. Um, so, um, but we, we actually have three Americans and two Brits, and I think we're going to have to take a Brit across to sort of re-establish our, our, our business plan. Um. Anyone else? Yeah, let's jump on here. Thank you all for your presentation. Thank you all for your presentations. Um, excellence will always win out. Um, two of the panel are sitting, uh, having built buildings for us. Uh, I work for the Foreign Office. Um, I apologize, we don't do competitions anymore because we don't have any money anymore. Um, uh, the, Hong Kong, the Hong Kong Consulate General was excellent. Uh, the Dublin Embassy, superb, thank you both. Um, excellence will win out. Chipperfield, uh, and um, uh, Foster winning huge projects in Berlin in the face of Germans is an astonishing thing um, and we just we simply must export better. I'd like to ask the panelists what percentage they think of their work they win uh, via recognized competitions which we should RIB should seriously champion, champion globally and how much is won by knowing uh, souls. As a, a difficult question I know but I think it's important uh, competitions are, are, are key. Um, I'm answering this because I've less left holding the microphone from the last question. Um, I, I think it's difficult to define what a competition is, actually. I mean, we, as a practice, we don't enter many open competitions. We, we often... In, I did, yes. Well, we, um, that is a two-stage competition where we, where we prequal um, through an ITT and then we might be one of five. Um, a lot of our work um, comes that way. Um, I think we were one of five at that, at that stage. Um, again, it varies from sector to sector. You know, if there's any public money, you know, if, then, then clearly some sort of procurement overlay applies to that. So... Um, a third of our work is for universities in the UK, and, and, and all of that comes through some sort of competitive procurement route, usually involving design. Um, in the commercial sector, it's who you meet in the sauna or who you go karaoke with, I think. You know, the, the, the procurement seems very different there. Um, in the transport sector, it just goes to a big engineer, and we're just sort of um, trying to follow them to work out if we can get some, get some work. So every sector is very different, in my experience. Um. When, I, when we talk about the term competition, quite often all clients will ask you to put forward a proposal and they'll be asking for a proposal from three people. So um, we did something for a school, only went in yesterday, and um, despite having been asked to do some approach sketches, were rung up today and said, I'm sorry, the fee's too great, we've gone to the, to the local architect. So everything usually has some it's not so much that it has to be a, a large architectural competition, although I would also encourage the RBA to do more of that because I think it's a great exemplar, the way they run their competitions. Um, but mostly everything is some kind of competitive um, interview or application or submission. Even if, if it's for people you've um, worked for before, ultimately they want the best... Um, concept for their site or their best approach or sometimes the best team and sometimes sadly just the lowest fee I agree with all that that's what happens every day we, we do competitive tenders for you name it from a, a commercial scheme to university scheme to whatever it is so it is actually very tough out there and I think that's that's partly the issue if if if, if we need to compete for something which is more high profile it needs to be kind of make our time as well, because I think we're one of the few professions in this country which sells our time for no money, really, most of the time. Not most of the time, but a lot of our time. You know, we do bids and we do feasibility studies and all that kind of stuff, and I don't know many lawyers who do feasibility studies for potential legal action. So I think there's a bit about that which we need to address as a profession to actually be a bit more proactive about how we get our fees and, you know, how many doctors do feasibility uh, you know, yeah, etc. You know what I mean. Thank you. Um, I still think a lot of it is who you know. 
dare and say it. You're going to compete. Of course you're going to compete. You want a fee, you want an idea. But if you don't know them, you won't even be asked to do that. So I think a good architect is out there, you know, treading the pavements, going to whatever he needs to or she needs to do to meet new people, whether that's in the UK or abroad. So just get off your backsides and go and talk to everybody. It's the only way you're going to get new work. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm very happy to report that I know what a prequel to an ITT means. So, on that note, um, I'm going to hand over to Chris uh, Williamson, who's going to have some closing remarks and things. Um, yeah, I just want to thank Aslina for helping put this together. Uh, Aslina's just joined uh, relatively recently to, to sort out our international uh, membership. Um, so the RIBA is hoping to become a global membership organization. And I think the way to do that is to raise the standard of our educational offer and our lifelong learning and make it more like a qualification and less like a, a member's club. So that we become the gold standard around the world. And I think what we've seen from the panel tonight is the architectural system we have here produces architects that people want around the world. And uh, I took out the four C's, cash, collaboration, competition, and culture, which they've all spoken about, uh, which are the key to, uh, to working abroad. So the RIBA is, is trying to put, it's putting together a, a database of like-minded individuals and firms around the world. And I think even small firms can, encourage, can be encouraged to work abroad if you've got a particular specialism in either health, education, transportation or hospitality and team up with a local architect. That's one way forward and young architects can win work abroad uh, just the same as, as established officers. Uh, so as part of Aslina's team, there's Emma and Vicky who've helped out organizing this. So I'd like to thank them and Catherine for chairing and fantastic presenters for presenting tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you.